Welcome into the KSO Show. I am Mason Voth. That is Derek Young on a Tuesday, bringing you your K-State headlines as we get closer to K-State, BYU, and Provo. The Cats' first dance with Big 12 after dark after a couple teams got to experience it last year with really just BYU, I guess, you know, some with with Colorado uh, in, in some ways. Um, we... I think people were pretty mindful of them last year and getting ready for their move to be made to the Big 12 and we're watching. Uh, and then BYU, I think Iowa State went there last year. Yep. Uh, somebody made an early trip out there. But really, for K-State fans, I think people will remember basketball, and that game felt like it started far too late. Uh, now we're going to be in this position where it, it, it is going to feel very late, 9.30. Uh, that's a football game where if you think about where the Tulane game took almost four hours. So we're talking, it could realistically be 1.30 Central time when that game ends uh, on Sunday. It will finish on Sunday uh, if you're watching from home in Kansas or anywhere, uh, I guess, east of Colorado. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about K-State BYU, a couple of things involved in that, clean up some things from Arizona, give the last word there, and uh, cover just a number of other topics involving K-State, at least in some manner, uh, as we bring you your K-State headlines this week. But before we do that, the number one headline is to remind you that you need to stop procrastinating about planning your trip to Ireland, especially if you're like me. The Wildcats are headed to Dublin next August for the Aer Lingus College Football Classic, and you can join your Wildcats by booking your getaway at cats2ireland.com. The best seats and hotels will go fast, so secure your package now. That's cats, the number two, Ireland.com. So time to kind of get on top of it, get rolling, and uh, get everything kind of in order to make sure that you're over there for K-State and Iowa State to start the 2025 season. All right, number of places that we could start, but uh, before we dive into anything that's actually going on currently on campus with K-State or the Big 12, anything like that, probably the most notable thing to take place uh, last week before, you know, K-State uh, was able to throttle Arizona. Simultaneously, Lincoln Cure was dominating the competition uh, for Goodland High School because he had a massive week uh, in, in his second week of high school football in the state of Kansas. Four touchdowns. Okay, that's, that's fine. Nine catches, 225 yards. A massive game. Uh, for Lincoln Cure, which is even crazier when you consider the fact that his quarterback in the game threw for 237 yards. Uh, so 225 for Lincoln Cure. The quarterback had 237 and five touchdowns as Goodland picked up their uh, first win of the season to get to one and one. We're only a handful of weeks away from getting to see Lincoln Cure, probably just under a month now. Uh, I mean, if there was any doubt about how good Lincoln Cure was, and we know that he's not always facing talent that is going to match his, that's tough to do, but he's going out there and playing like somebody that is superior to his foes. Yeah, it's tough for him to go and, and play top-notch competition during the season, right? He's out there in Western Kansas playing some Eastern Colorado schools, I believe. Uh, I think I saw where he hasn't actually played a team from Kansas yet, I don't think. So... He has that issue, but you know what normally would be an issue and why I'm really impressed with what Lincoln Cure has been able to do is those small schools a lot of times because of either, you know, just not having a talented enough teammates either or a paltry, you know, or a poor offensive line or, or a quarterback that can't get you the ball. Like going to catch a four touchdown passes and over 200 yards at that level of Kansas is pretty impressive regardless of anything. So, you know, I, I think it's not less impressive because of the competition he's facing. I actually think it's more impressive because that's just hard to do at that level of Kansas high school football in general, because you're not known for throwing the ball at that level. Yeah. I mean, that's, and that's a big deal too for for some of these plays. Like that that throw right there is something that most teams the size of Goodland are not attempting right there. Like there's not a lot of that even in some of the bigger classes. And there you see Lincoln Cure. I mean he's gonna he's gonna line up back there sometimes and just take yeah. the snap directly, and, and just and, get and by yeah. everybody. And that's another thing. And good, and good on the Goodland 
coaches for letting him play tight end for the most part, since that's what he's going to do at the next level. But a lot of times you have a player as good as Lincoln Gear, you're just going to line him up at quarterback and let him do what he does at that level because he's the best player on the field. And if you don't, it's probably hard to get him the ball. So that's why they do that. Uh, but him being able to play tight end for Goodland and, and catching nine passes for over 200 yards and four touchdowns is quite frankly more impressive regardless of the competition he's playing, just because that doesn't happen at that level. Yeah, no doubt about it. He, he, uh, he definitely is able to showcase his skills at the level he's playing at, but I think it still highlights just how good he is. And again, like at the end of the day, some of these plays where he's dragging guys and running them over, it's not like it's just, you know, even though there's a size difference there, it's not like that's a normal thing for anybody to do, no matter who's trying to, to bring it down so he's he's an impressive player no doubt and uh, i think you're you're absolutely right to uh also give some of the shared credit to the the circumstance that uh the goodland coaching staff has for allowing him to be in the position uh to play tight end and also still finding unique ways that obviously they can try and help their football team because i mean at the end of the day in a lot of these scenarios not necessarily goodland specifically but a lot of these places, if they had an athlete like Lincoln Cure, it's we're going to put the ball in your hands every time and you're going to be our quarterback. And that that's what they're going to do as opposed to being mindful of the situation. I mean, we know Junction City, for example, uh, they would they would have to make some switches when Michael Boganowski was there uh, and, and put him back there. So it's about finding the balance between doing what's right for your player, but also trying to come through for your team. Uh, and Lincoln Cure and Goodland seem to have a good balance right now, and it'll be interesting to see how they play throughout the uh, rest of the season because they they are a team that has kind of been up and down um, and and have struggled at times. So we'll see how it goes. And uh, I was going to bring up real quick uh, what the upcoming schedule for Goodland looks like because we'll be there in a couple weeks uh, on our way out to Colorado. Yeah, uh, I think go watch I think, that game. I think that's the October 11th game. I want to say Friday night against Colby. I believe mm. and we'll be at and I should have got his name before we uh started recording, but shout out to the um the Goodland quarterback too, getting on yeah. the ball. I mean, yeah, sure. uh yeah, the the schedule coming up for uh, Goodland. They're at Oakley this week and then at Holcomb uh before they get back to face Ulysses and Colby at home, which we'll be there to see. So that is uh Lincoln Cure doing what you'd expect from K State's five star commit. Right there. All right, let's move on to K-State and uh, finish some things up with talking about the Arizona game and the final takeaways there. Uh, you and I haven't actually gotten together to share our thoughts on the game because you were busy with three mall afterwards. So it was Drew and I. And then yesterday, Drew and I talked about climbing and everything. Um, Arizona is kind of an enigma now because K-State deserves a lot of credit for beating the brakes off of them like they did and Super putting... Worse. <laughs> yeah, and, and putting a stop to Noah Fafita and Tetero McMillan still had a massive night. Feels like K-State did a good job of defending him. But what do we make of that performance now? Because, yes, K-State played well, but how good do we think Arizona is currently and how much credit can we give K-State for what they did? I mean, I think Arizona, Arizona is solid enough to where you dominate the game that the way Kansas State did. I think you're always going to give them credit for doing what they did. Now, they because it wasn't just 31 to seven, and that could have been easily at least 41 to seven, the way that it went. And you beat anybody in the Big 12, especially a team that even if they're middle of the pack, 41 to seven. I think you're going to be like, yeah, hell of a job. So I'm not going to take anything away from what Kansas State did. But one of the takeaways, and I know this is what you were leading into, is that I'm not sure how good Arizona is. And by that, I mean they're probably not a top 20 team. They might be top 30, top 35, uh, 40, along those lines. 20 probably is pushing it. I think they have some really good individual pieces. I think that they have some glaring holes as well. Um, and... I think that's magnified when you take all three games into the equation. I just don't think that coaching staff knows what they have yet. So there's not a lot of, uh, you know, utilization knowledge there. I think they're still getting used to the new staff. I think they're still getting used to the new schemes, the new playbook, the new strategies, the new approaches. So like that cohesion 
and like meshing just isn't there. And I don't know how long it'll take for it to get there. Sometimes it takes a whole season. So I just think the newness that we talked about new staff, um, some of the pieces that are so, so, so good will still be so, so, so good, but other pieces may not look as good in year one under Brent Brennan as they did under Jed fish previously, just because they had time in the system there with Jed fish. So I, I have questions about Arizona uh, and just how they will do. Uh, and, and they're going to be in a lot of unfamiliar venues against unfamiliar teams. I mean, obviously Kansas State didn't know Arizona either, but they're the home team. Yeah. The Big 12 is still the conference that they've always been in. There's still seven, eight other teams that they play off in that are still in the league. So they're, the newness is not as stark there. But uh, one thing I, would, I wouldn't I would take away from Kansas State especially – is that they? Uh, I thought they punished the Arizona offensive line quite a bit. And if I'm going to say one thing about Arizona, I know that they have a good offensive line. So I thought that was a really good to see. Well, and to what you're saying there about Arizona going on the road, new conference, having to adjust that. That's kind of where K State's going to sit this weekend when they go to BYU. Uh, even though BYU's been in for a year, it's still a little bit of an adjustment. The one benefit that K State is going to have uh, in in that game. Uh, versus what they would have had, like, say, they were going on the road to Arizona, is Kalani Sataki's been at BYU for a long time. So even though BYU hasn't been in your league for a while, they do have continuity there, and they're essentially the same program and team the last couple of years. And it's not a short week, and they're not breaking in a new coach yeah. of their own like Arizona was. Yeah, so uh, I think that'll be interesting. It's really just about trying to figure out how much stock – makes sense to put into what K-State did to Arizona. Because I, I think it's the best win that a Big 12 team has this season to date. Um, but, again, is it is it as good as we would have thought? Uh, I, think say, I, I think say I like would. Jed Fish had been there still as head coach versus, you know, leaving for Washington and Brent Brennan taking over. I know this won't be popular to the Kent State fans listening. I think Iowa State winning at Iowa is more impressive. Okay, it's not a popular thing to say with me, but I understand uh, the sentiment that it's you're a road going. Game. It's a road game, rivalry. I, I don't know that there's a huge gap between Iowa and Arizona. Yeah, I mean, what what's the final score uh, of the K-State-Arizona game if Cade McNamara is at quarterback instead of Noah Fafita? I mean, they score zero instead of seven. Like it's not a whole lot of different, right? Yeah, but do they do they get to like the fifty yard line that many times and hold the ball for that long? <laughs> I, the difference would only be maybe four points, seven to three or okay. something. And K State doesn't score as much on Iowa. Hmm. Okay. Well, that makes it that makes me feel like you're. Uh, but I, uh, but here's something I will say, and and why I do still put plenty of stock in that win. And I said this on, on other places. I don't know if I've said it on any of our shows yet. Is obviously beating a team by twenty, beating a top twenty team by twenty four points is good. Yeah, but how good is Arizona? I was like, well, let's put it. It should probably be at least forty one to seven. Like, okay, still, what do you think? I was like, but I still think that was like, for what I think Kansas State's upside potential and capability is, especially on the offensive side of the ball. I thought they were still. Like, I thought they were good, and they made a big step forward, and I liked what I saw from a progression standpoint in, in terms of continuing to improve every single game and by a noticeable amount. I think that happened, but I still think we're pretty far away from what how good the Kansas State offense can be, but I think that's a good thing. You just blew out Arizona, and I still think your offense is still finding their legs a little bit. Yeah, it, and that's – K-State is, is getting there. They're on the edge. It feels like of getting closer to the, the full capabilities of their offense, uh, but they aren't they aren't there th yet. And one of the things that might be holding them back is wide receiver because we saw another tough showing for Dante Cephas in the game against Arizona, and it wasn't even this time the fact that it, he was really a nothing burger in the game. It was the fact that he had two drops on – early in the game, including one that Avery Johnson made a great throw uh, and would have been big yardage and I think would have avoided K-State eventually having to convert that uh, fourth and one that they had. And then he had another one later uh, in the game where the throw wasn't as good as it could have been from Avery Johnson, but I think it still should have been caught by Dante Cephas. And uh, you, were, you were talking before we got going here about how the snap counts are starting to kind of line up 
for receivers and, and how different they're starting to look. They're getting closer uh, because Dante Cephas, 21 snaps in the game on Friday. Trey Spivey at 18, Jaden Jackson at 20. What do you make of the wide receiver situation for K-State right now, which, by the way, still has not caught a touchdown pass this season. It's all been to running backs or tight ends. Uh, Jace Brown had a really good game, um, and I really liked the way he worked back to the ball and did yards after catch. That was big. Keegan Johnson had a huge catch on a dig route, I think, in a pivotal moment. I think th those two are trusted by the coaching staff and are trusted by Avery Johnson. I think – I, I know that Avery Johnson trusts Trey Spivey and has a good chemistry and report with him because he's still like working out the kinks a little bit that are there at times probably that we don't see or don't know. I think the coaching staff is beginning to trust Trey Spivey the way that Avery does. And I think that's important. And I think that's why those snap counts are starting to, I think at the, what by game one, by game one, during game one, Dante Cephas snaps are up here, Jane Jackson right around here, and Trey Spivey's there. Game three, they're all right there, 21, 18, um, whatever it was. So I think it's the coach and staff starting to trust Trey Spivey much more. And quite frankly, I think the biggest difference between the three of those is the report and chemistry that Avery Johnson has with Trey Spivey versus the other two. We've seen more than one or two balls this year where it doesn't seem like Avery Johnson can get on the same page with either Cephas or Jackson. Yeah, that's that's a good point, too. There was also the the one where Avery went deep and Cephas just kind of broke off, and uh, it was it seemed very clear in the moment that the the wrong party there was Dante Cephas. So, and, and what's you know unique is that there are, there are times where you think, okay, maybe it's going to happen. He made that really nice catch uh against Tulane he was just out of bounds like I think the talent is still there there's just something that has to be unlocked and if you're talking about the way that uh receiver snap counts ended up working out look no further than going back one week and against Tulane where Jace Brown had 48 that led the team no surprise there then if you look around the rest of the lineup Keegan Johnson had 40 Dante Cephas was the third highest snap count getter of the receivers at 30 Jaden Jackson was at 20, and Trey Spivey was only at six in that game. So they've even made that adjustment in a six-day period where they think, okay, we got to try and give some other things. I mean, is the expectation that Trey Spivey gets more reps in the game on Saturday against BYU than Dante Cephas if the game you know, stays within a uh, probably a 10-point margin? It'll be curious because the difference here is now you're playing in a big-time road atmosphere that Trey Spivey probably hasn't done yet, and Dante Cephas has. So I wonder if they try to lean on Cephas still because of that and give him maybe like that one last shot to grab the bull by the horns and take this starting job and run with it. Because not only, and think of it this way, and not only is it Spivey, but same, this is the first true road start for Avery Johnson. Um, yeah. He's had what, well, well he had Tulane. But yeah. in an atmosphere wise, this is the first yeah. part, the first test. So do you want to do you want to surround him with the guys that kind of done it before a little bit more? It'll be interesting, like what that dynamic, how that plays into the coaching staff decision. Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be fascinating. I I think that you're on the cusp of having to just go. I mean, Trey Spivey probably des deserves a greater cut of the, the snaps because I do think there's a good relationship between him and Avery Johnson there. And in those small sample sizes, he's looked good this season. Um, but I think you also still, I mean, you're only three games in. I don't think you want to fully cut off the potential of what Dante Cephas could do for you because if you get it figured out, there is some big-time help that he could provide. And I think if you are going to just say Spivey's our guy at some point, I think it's easier to do and more productive for him to do it maybe in a home game or it's a little bit yeah. more comfortable rather than uh, let's put it this way is this going to be the toughest road environment that Kansas State plays in all, all year could be yeah I mean Iowa State yeah Iowa State will probably be the toughest uh at least on paper but by the end of the season you just you never really know and then BYU, also BYU they, they'll be more defeated. adjusted BYU being 3-0 means that yeah. they're going to be rowdy I mean Iowa State will probably be good no matter what. BYU has the potential to be a little bit louder. Yeah, I don't I don't expect much from 
Colorado or Houston or what the state West Virginia will be in by the time K State gets there. Colorado maybe games are, are kind of hype. Um, those games are selling out still. There's still a lot of excitement around him. So that there, there's potential for that one. But what I will say is I think there might be a strong Kansas State contention at the Colorado game. Yeah, and I mean, if you're packing it with a bunch of people that are only there for the Sanders family um, and not there for Colorado, I, I'm not too concerned yeah. uh, about and, and, that. And I'm not worried about West Virginia or Houston. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, we talked BYU a little bit there. Uh, BYU, as you mentioned, they're 3-0 this year. Not only are they 3-0, they're 3-0 against the spread in every game, including their outright win at SMU when they were almost an 11-point fi- uh, dog. Yep. And then they've dominated Southern Illinois and Wyoming on the road this past weekend. Um, where where do you feel BYU is at right now? Because going into the season, I think their win total was only four and a half maybe. Uh, and now they got certainly an extra win that people didn't see coming in against SMU. And they are doing what a lot of Big 12 teams are struggling with right now, and it's winning games that you're supposed to win. So where do you feel BYU is at right now? And what kind of level of threat do they pose to K-State? Their defense has been really, really good. Their offense has not impressed me one bit to this point. Uh, but beating SMU – outright was impressive i i that was one of my best bets i believe but i didn't expect an outright win um it's interesting when you hear smu you also think offense no defense that that game turned into a a defensive slobber knocker so that's kind of a weird one what i will say is what i can tell from them being three no against the spread and watching them a couple times one thing is they've played two pretty bad teams and one really overrated team Southern Illinois is not good. Wyoming is really bad. And SMU was incredibly overrated to begin the year. Secondly, the fact that they are 3-0 gets spread at least tells me that they are overachieving and they are still better than what most projected entering the season. So now now you're sitting there 3-0. You get a home night game against the almost top 10 team. It's going to be a rowdy environment. Everyone is believing, even if the team is probably playing a little over their heads compared to what the projections were, but that's not, that's no small thing because due to their confidence, you know, confidence is a, is a weird thing, especially to college age kids that we're covering. Right. So they start to get a little bit more confident. They believe they're this good. They start to play like it too. Yeah, that's true. That it can be a big thing. And, uh, and the, the other thing that confidence can do is yes, it can set you up to make, big errors, which Jake Rett's laugh is not opposed to making at quarterback, but it can also lead you to maybe taking some more chances that you want it. And you can also make plays off that. Like, I I mean, I would compare it to probably how Will Howard played uh, at the end of the 2022 season where he was just letting it rip in those games against West Virginia and Baylor. And he was, he was threading the needle in those games. Like, I think that was a guy that went out there with not a lot to lose. And after how he played against TCU, I think he had all the, the confidence in the world. So we saw a different Will Howard, and it kind of carried into 2023 where it went the opposite way, where he made the mistakes and couldn't make the play that needed to be made. So it's a fine line between being greatness or dog crap uh, when you're playing with a lot of confidence and maybe you don't have – the talent that necessarily is going to match that confidence level, but it can make BYU a dangerous team combined with the fact that Kalani Sataki uh, is a big time gambler when it comes to coaching his football team. I was telling somebody today, most coaches can either, depending on how they coach, can either win you an extra game or lose you an extra game. That range for Kalani Sataki is like three games over the course of a season. So, there's going to be a lot of wild card to what BYU does. And then you mentioned the fact that this might be the toughest crowd K-State faces this year. Two 3-0 teams, uh, a top opponent coming in. Uh, I do expect Provo to be ready. Yeah, they'll be ready. And, yeah, for those that aren't caught up to speed yet on what BYU is about, uh, you put it pretty well there. They will take a bunch of risks. They will go for it on fourth down just about anywhere on the field and any down and distance. Um, some people have kind of equated Kalani Sataki to a little bit of Ron Rivera in the NFL, where there is no risk that he doesn't at least consider taking. 
uh, fakes, trick plays, everything's on the board with the way that they operate. Yeah. Uh, All right. Let's uh, move on here and talk a little bit of the Big 12 in general. And I'm going to give you a handful of teams and you're going to tell me if how they are playing is overrated, underrated or properly rated in terms of how credit from the outside is being given there right now. Because I think three three games in the season, we can kind of start to get a vibe for uh, like BYU, for example probably still being undervalued by people or maybe you know in your eyes that they're getting the right level of respect which is probably somewhere just uh, in the middle then you have other teams like Utah who's 3 and 0 and they haven't looked great this year but they kind of ha- can hide behind the fact that Cam Rising was there and then everybody in between so you're going to tell me if a team's overrated underrated or properly rated based on how they are playing right now. And we'll start uh, with the team. You're, you've got the Beaver Fever today. I also have a Pac-12 team. I've got Sparky on my shirt here. So we'll start with Arizona State. The Sun Devils are 3-0, and and they are getting ready this weekend for a pretty significant matchup uh, of their own on the road at Texas Tech, who all of a sudden has life. So – is Kenny Dillingham's squad overrated, underrated, or properly rated three games into the season? Probably underrated if they're still considered three-point dogs in Lubbock, although that, I guess that comes out to maybe a coin flip on a neutral site, which could be accurate if Texas Tech just got out of the gates a little slow, but, I mean, that's probably putting it kindly, too. Look, Arizona State, you look at Wyoming, yeah, probably not very good. Texas State's a solid group of five team. And who's the other team they beat? Sorry, uh, losing track of this one. Uh, yeah, Arizona State. They beat uh, Mississippi State, Texas um, State, and then yeah, they're uh, they're so, uh, what, season. We, I took them on the under in their wins total of four and a half because I thought their schedule would be tougher. I I still think Texas State's pretty solid, but I think we're also finding out that Wyoming and Mississippi State are quite dog crap yeah. too. So they took advantage of that, but that's what good teams do as well. I will say when you watch Arizona State, I. I think they're going to run into a problem towards the end of the season where they run out of gas because they don't have a lot of depth. But they do have some dudes that can really play. So they're passing the eye test right now. And if they can avoid the injury bug, uh, they could probably get to a bowl game. So yeah. I will say they're probably still being underrated in terms of value right now. But the like I said, the X factor is like just one injury or just a little bad luck and things could really go south for them because they absolutely have no depth. Yeah, uh, Cam Scadaboo is playing great football at running back for him right now. He has 68 carries through three games, averaging five and a half a touch there. The next closest ball carrier with 30 is Sam Levitt, their quarterback. And then you have 14 carries for DeCarlos Brooks, uh, their backup running back. So it's not a situation like where, you know, we see K-State with the luxury that they have at running back right now, obviously. Uh, the split between touches for DJ Giddens and Dylan Edwards is 49 to 15. So Giddens with less than what Scadaboo has had to do, and then Edwards with more than what Brooks has done in an offense that is giving the ball to the running back more. Uh, and then, like, KU would be another great example of this, a team that has a great running back. I mean, Devin Neal, 45 carries this year, 7.4 a touch. Daniel Highshaw's right there at 16. So the workload that is being put on Cam Scadaboo is pretty heavy right there, uh, especially when you consider the fact that he's pacing for over two catches a game as well. So he's heavily involved in the Arizona State offense. Uh, he's probably one of the bigger keys because he's kind of like their get out of jail free card where uh, he's always going to give them a chance because he can make a big play and he's just a really gritty player. But Uh, It'll be fascinating to see how their game goes with Texas Tech this weekend, who we can move on to next because the Red Raiders are 2-1 and right now, but I think most people still feel like they should be treated like an 0-3 team based off their first two games of the season. We had power rankings going through today. You said on Texas Tech you're not going to give them a ton of credit for the win against North Texas. I'm kind of in the same boat. So are the Red Raiders overrated, underrated, properly rated? I guess I need to see where everyone's thoughts on Texas Tech are na- nationally. I, 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 it's hard to get a pulse sometimes. What I will say is they've been very underwhelming. 
They beat Ab- They had a good overtime and beat Abilene and Christian by one. They had no fight in them in the Washington State game. And then, yeah, I just, yeah, I need to see more. Go boat race North Texas. That's fine. That's not going to flip my thoughts on you when I kind of jumped off the bandwagon after week two. Uh, let's continue with the trend of finding matchups from the Big 12 this weekend that are wildly fascinating for not great reasons. Uh, <laughs> because there are a lot of them where it's kind of a loser leaves town type situation. Especially KU, the one in Morgantown. Yeah, yeah, KU and West Virginia, the Jayhawks are two and a half point dogs after losing their second straight game. This one at home, the UNLV. Uh, where does KU sit right now in your eyes? Uh, probably properly rated because I think people are kind of jumping ship there already in terms of how they view Kansas. Hey, maybe UNLV is not bad. Maybe Illinois is not bad. I I don't know. We'll see. I mean, ULV beat the crap out of Houston, who gave Oklahoma a scare. Uh, the transit of property doesn't really work in college football. It's more so that the team you get is one week is not the team you get the next week. That's what that is. So I just I'm I'm kind of off Kansas, but I think everyone's off Kansas right now. So it's probably properly done. They're, to be honest. And no one thought we'd be saying this. If we thought we'd be saying that if they were one and two, something probably happened to Jalen Daniels. Nothing's happened to Jalen Daniels. He's just not played well. Yeah, I, that's the that's the thing. It's there's no injury news that's come out now. We Lord knows we would hear about the injury news with Jalen Daniels if it was there. He's just struggling right now. And then, as predicted, Jeff Grimes was a terrible decision. By Lance Leipold. I mean, a terrible quote too. Apparently, yeah. I mean, good night. If I was a KU fan, I'd I'd be at the door of the facility today, trying to break the doors down and take him and toss him in that lake yeah. or pond, you, whatever they have down there that they love. You know me. I don't really overreact to what coaches say much because I think it's most times it's overdone. I think like what it what it means. But to say, but I mean to say we haven't hit rock bottom yet. But basically saying I can't wait until we do is kind of a a weird thing to admit. So I'm just not feeling that one. What I would, if I'm going to try to go glass half full for it for the any Kansas fan that might listen, I would say despite how much crap we're talking about them right now, despite how badly Jalen Daniels has played, there if they can pick up a football, I think they're three and zero. <laughs> Yeah, and the other thing too is is that sh- that probably shouldn't be lost in all this is that their defense is playing pretty well this year relative to what maybe the expectation should have and would have been. And the other note in regards to that is that they're doing it without forcing a ton of turnovers because that was the thing for KU last year. They had really good turnover luck. They've only forced two turnovers through three games this year, but they're still doing a decent enough job of keeping their opponents kind of tied down in terms of scoring and moving the ball. So their problems are probably a lot greater than the problems that K-State encountered after the Tulane game. But I think they're similar in nature where they could still get things figured out. The only issue is they do have an offensive coordinator that there's not a ton of trust there right now. The difference is Kansas State as a program is good enough to figure out a way to win that game, and KU does it. I think in the commentary that I applied, I said, I don't know how good UNLV and Illinois are, but I don't think if I was going to power rank them in the Big 12 that I would put them in the top half of the Big 12. Yeah. Uh, I got one other question that I'll throw out to you here. Do you think that because of the path that Lance Leipold has taken to get to where he is now? I mean, he was the, the head coach at Wisconsin Whitewater for eight seasons and then six seasons at Buffalo. And now uh, this is year number four at KU. Chris Kleiman has overcome this and proven himself that he has the connections elsewhere to bring in good coaches when he has staff members move on or his internal hires make sense. Leipold had to go and find a replacement for Andy Kotelnicki. He ended up with Jeff Grimes. Is, Is Leipold's background tough for him to have those connections to bring in somebody that could maybe give their offense a better ceiling than Grimes when you consider like Kleiman was able to bring in Matt Wells after losing Colin Klein. It's possible, but 
like I don't know that you have to have connections to make coaching hires anymore. I mean, I don't think Andy Kotelnicki was connected to Penn State in any way. They're like, hey, that guy's good. Let's go hire him. So I don't put a whole st- lot of stock into it. But what I will say, what what does matter is that this is the first time he's ever coached without Andy Kotelnicki. So it tells me that Andy Kotelnicki is really, really good. And replacing him is really, really tough because there's going to be a pretty – drastic drop off from him to just about anyone it's probably bigger than it needs to be because he didn't get this higher right um which was predictable but it, i don't think because i think you can go out and find a competent coach regardless i think the problem is is andy kodal nicky was the magic sauce and they did and they did and that in general i just think losing him is tough uh replacing him is, replacing him is tough yeah all right other half of that matchup this week in morgantown West Virginia, another one and two Big 12 team. The Penn State loss, you know, could somewhat be excusable. But then I, and I was banging this drum early on there. Well, we both have been West Virginia haters through yeah. the offseason and getting to this point. And then I kept saying that West Virginia loss to Penn State looked even worse after Penn State struggled with Bowling Green. I picked Pitt, Pitt last week. Lo and behold, Pitt got it done. A bad collapse by West Virginia. Where does West Virginia sit right now in your eyes? Bad. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, collapsing like that uh, is pretty bad. Yeah, I mean, to have that game won and to give it away, they were the home team as well, right? Uh, they, that was a road game, but oh, you were playing game. in an NFL stadium. Yeah, playing so. an NFL stadium. Hey, where do we stay when we play at West Virginia? Pittsburgh. So it's yeah. like, whatever. Um, no, that's bad. They're, they're, they might. I think what I said about them is they might be worse than I thought. And that's just not – here's the problem, I think, for Kansas and West Virginia going forward. The loser of that game is 1-3, and three, and yeah. and that is so problematic because both of those programs, right or wrong, KU probably right, West Virginia probably wrong, entered the season, at least from the fan base standpoint, with a ton of expectations. Yeah. I think you could, you could justify it as Kansas. Me and you just could not justify it for West Virginia. Yes, they won nine games. Yep. They won nine games last year against the most easiest Big 12 schedule that you can build. Um, this year, the schedule is a lot more tougher. So I, 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 it's just hard, it was hard for me to buy into West Virginia. I'm kind of getting proven correct on them, even though I've been proven wrong on others, especially Texas Tech, obviously, in Arizona State. But I had West Virginia nailed down. Um, I think the loser of this game, it's kind of like you said, a loser lo- leaves down because I think whoever loses this game, it's going to be very, very, very hard for them to pick themselves off the floor um, yeah. at one and three and comparatively to what the expectations were. Because, the, I mean, the loser, I mean, the, the fan bases of both of those programs are already melting down. Yeah. One of them's going to lose again. Yeah, and the good news would be for KU, even if you lose this game against West Virginia, the remaining schedule is pretty manageable. Even I know that they've lost, they would have lost three in a row, whatever, to teams you don't feel like are great, but it's manageable because it's TCU, Arizona State, Houston, at K State, Iowa State, at BYU is your toughest stretch, but then Colorado at home, at Baylor. KU could still very well find themselves as a six and six bowl eligible team, even if they get to one three. West Virginia, if they lose to KU this weekend, it's disastrous. It's at O State, Iowa State. K-State at Arizona in four consecutive weeks after a bye week. And that and, would not be good. And consider the fashion that these teams are losing. Like West Virginia got their asses kicked by Penn State and then a total collapse against Pitt. On the flip side, Kansas, if Jalen Daniels is just is bad instead of a disaster, they're 3-0. and If they can pick up a ball, they're 3-0. and Like Kansas is not far off as much as we want to make fun of them. But at the yep. same time, they're in trouble until Jalen Daniels gets better. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you you are what your record says you are, uh, which is you know something to take away with it. Uh, another team that I want to mention is Baylor because they're interesting from the standpoint. I don't know that we expected Baylor to be good, but they had one last ditch effort at trying to be I think a better team this year with Daquan Finn, who could maybe be their X factor. Uh, he got benched in their win over the weekend against Air Force, and Sawyer Robertson came in and with just one game of being the main guy, 
Uh, Sawyer Robertson now leads Baylor in passing yards this season, despite uh, only playing in two games, and he only attempted five passes in his first game against Tarleton. Uh, where do you think Baylor sits right now? And did Sawyer Robertson save the Bears' season as they prepare to go to Boulder? Daquan Finn is clearly not the fix. And unless Sawyer Robertson is miraculously the fix, despite not winning the quarterback battle in the offseason, then I think Baylor is just like they were the last two years because they have the same issue. They're, they're, maybe their defense is okay, but you don't you have a quarterback problem. I think it, it, it just seems like the same team uh, if Daquan Finn is indeed not the fix and you're having to rely upon Sawyer Robertson. Yeah, also uh, history would maybe suggest that Sawyer Robertson is not the guy. He wasn't very good last season uh, when he played, although he did finish strong. He had a good game uh, against West Virginia despite a loss. Uh, final team that I had down for you, I know that you're still high on them, Utah gets ready to go on the road to take on Oklahoma State. Cam Rising did not play last week. The Utes still were able to find a way to win by uh, a couple scores against Utah State. Uh, what do you think of the Utes right now, with or without Cam Rising? It all rests on the health of Cam Rising, because when they have had him, I think they're the best team that I've seen play in the Big 12 this season. But when he's not playing, I mean, they look like – fifth, sixth in the Big 12, it's kind of that brutal on offense without him. So assuming that he's going to play 11 games this year, regular season games or, or 10 or whatever, I, th I think they're still the favorite. But if it's anything less than that, then th they got issues as well. Yeah, uh, fascinating week of Big 12 games, as I mentioned. Uh, K-State and BYU actually might be the, the most um, – a neglected matchup, at least in terms of what it might mean overall, uh, because Houston and Cincinnati, those are the two bottom feeders of the league. They square off at, at, in Cincinnati. KU is at West Virginia, like we talked about. Arizona State, Texas Tech, those are two teams that are in the middle of the pack that are trying to prove themselves right now. Utah, Oklahoma State, obviously, whoever wins that one feels like they might have the first leg up in the race to Arlington. And then Baylor at Colorado is another one with teams in kind of the bottom tier that could get fascinating. And then uh, it's a it's a non league league game, but TCU is at SMU uh, for the Iron Skillet this weekend, which is also fascinating because both teams have you know you can make cases for them being up or down. It's non league no matter what. That's not a league game. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. It's not a league league matchup like the others. I'm not going to mention Iowa State and Arkansas State this weekend, I, even though I don't, I don't know that they're in a meaningful game this week. Maybe it's their week off, but an interesting team we haven't even mentioned is UCF because all of a sudden in yeah. multiple models, they're number one in the big 12. Yeah, they're uh, they are off this week. And then next week uh, they are, let me see is next week. Their game with Florida, I think oh, it might be. Yeah. Uh, no, they, they're at home against Colorado. So they won't face Florida until, uh, that's a little later on then, I guess. Uh, let's see. that uh, Week six. So uh, the weekend of K-State's bye week, their first bye week, is when UCF is at Florida. So that will be a fascinating one. Yeah, they're they're a fascinating team. I, like, if you give me that, I'd say they're probably overrated because I don't think they're number one in the Big 12. I agree. Um, and it was impressive that they were able to mount a comeback on the road like they did when they found a way to defeat TCU on Saturday, but I'm troubled by the fact they went down by 21 to begin with. Yeah. And predictable for TCU to yeah. collapse in that game. It's oh, just it's fraud, fraud again too. Yeah. Or like some of these teams like TCU, you're, you're not good again. Yeah. But well, we have the, we have the fraud watch yeah. right there. Sonny Dykes, uh, he is. Three. He needs to go. To oh, that three. that. The, excuse me. These are not the updated ones. Uh, after uh, this was from when we re oh, four, recorded three. during the games. Let me give you the updated look at Fraud Watch. Yes, Sonny Dykes has been moved over to an advisory with Joey McGuire. So there you go. Ooh, Gus on watch. That seems a little early. Huh? Uh, he's he's been there since the the, the offseason. He was there in the preseason. He still has a lot to prove to me. Um, so, and I don't know when he's going to actually be able to, to get over that hump. I think probably, 
Uh, it's going to take that game at Iowa State. He doesn't necessarily need to win it, but if he can go on the road and put up a good fight, then I'll, I'll buy into the Gus Bus hype, and uh, he can move into probably no man's land. I don't know that any of those guys can become studs yet this year. Mm -hmm. um, unless Kalani Sataki just rips off like a 10-2 and two season, <laughs> yeah. um, but it seems unlikely. Quarterback Lance Leipold could get back over to stud territory if his quarterback quits giving the ball to the other team. I think Matt Campbell has the chance to go to stud territory, unfortunately. No, it, no. He's, I, I, I think it's in front of him. What I will say is, like, I wouldn't move Dion off of warning, but what they did to Colorado State was actually better than I could have thought they would do. Maybe. Um, I don't know. The difference is Colorado is a team with a terrible head coach and a really talented quarterback. Uh, Colorado State is a team with a really terrible head coach and a not very talented quarterback. Not a guy that I'd give $500,000 to. No, so. but I mean, they struggled to beat them last year. So, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Improvement. Uh, but did was Nicolosi the quarterback last year for that game? Oh, well, I don't know, but I don't, I'm, I'm not sure it would matter. I, I need yeah. to go hit a well, <laughs> I'm just trying to throw some shots in there. Uh, yeah. let's let me let me get a quick check of that uh box score double OT. No, I guess he was. He did throw three interceptions in that game last season, though. So, I guess if you want any positive for Colorado, it's that their defense is significantly better this year which I think is actually legit because they did lock Nebraska down in that second half. So really, I mean, the issue is they still don't know what they're doing on offense other than trying to prop up uh, Dion's son's stats. So we'll see uh, how they end up looking. But they have that fascinating game with Baylor this weekend. So, all right, well, we'll get out of here. That'll do it for your headlines this week. Be back again tomorrow. Drew and I will talk K-State football recruiting. Last week, we gave you basketball recruiting with DY. So if you missed that, go back, watch it. It's on the YouTube currently. And then Drew and I tomorrow discussing K-State football recruiting. I'm sure he will have thoughts on Lincoln Cures, massive night uh, on Friday, and also some other news and updates after a pretty impressive visitor list for a Friday night game for K-State against Arizona. So plenty of that and more tomorrow on the KSO Show. And also, you can go to kstateonline.com over at On3, where we've always got coverage of the Cats going 24-7. So for Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. Thanks for watching and listening. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.